It's a genuine pleasure to um, <clears throat> stand before you this evening and address a subject that, like so many other subjects we're looking at this week, is one of controversy and confusion. And hopefully this evening we will clear the air, uh, remove some of the smoke and mirrors that governments and media present, and see the real truth um, on this particular issue. And um, it's something that uh, will affect this generation and the generations to come. It's an important topic that we're going to be looking at. As the title says, Extreme Danger, and that's a little forewarning as to what we're going to be looking at. Some of the material is actually going to be quite shocking. First of all, let's look at the whole issue of how this all began. If we go back several decades to the time when uh, Henry Kissinger served as National Security Advisor to the President in the US, he made the observation that control oil and you control nations. Control food and you control the people. A very insightful observation. Soon thereafter, a, an aggressive policy of undermining small family farms and supporting massive agribusiness got underway. And this policy in turn led to the creation of what we today call GMOs or genetically modified organisms. And this affected the heritage, traditional heritage seeds and converted them into something very strange and unusual. Seeds that uh, had never existed before in human history. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, we go on. Of course, it was the Rockefeller Foundation, the very same foundation that funded the Flexner Report early in the 20th century that destroyed virtually all systems of health care except allopathic medicine, which it strongly supported. And that was because most drugs were being synthesized from coal tar-based derivatives, which was a byproduct of the petrochemical industry over which Mr. Rockefeller was a multi-billionaire. So it all had to do with money, it all had to do with greed, and didn't have an awful lot to do with science. Also, there was the patenting process. And when you take a traditional or heritage seed, you can't really patent it because the creator made it. So by doing some unique things to these seeds and to plant matter, they could then claim a patent on it. And in recent decades, the patenting, patenting of life forms has become big business. There's a World Trade Organization. There's a World Intellectual Property Rights Organization. And their business and their goal is to make money through patenting of rights. And now virtually the entire world of biology, the natural creation, is being patented left and right and center. Um, the next part of that plan was to ensure that these new seeds would be basically forced upon farmers, first in the United States, then other countries of the world. And that has as well been happening on a massive scale. So let's go on then and consider what I refer to as the big lie. Strategically speaking, when this was being planned, and nothing happens by chance in this world, everything is planned. I was mentioning to someone a short time ago when we talk about adverse or side effects of drugs, they're not accidental. The drug company executives plan for those side effects, design their drugs to create those side effects in order to market other drugs. Sounds a bit sinister, diabolical, and it is, but it's also reality. So strategically speaking, you must first convince the world of your good and your noble intentions. We're going to save the world with genetically modified seeds and foods. And this is accomplished through telling what are half-truths, some outright lies, engaging in subtle deceptions, and of course, we have to have media manipulation. They all go together. By promising farmers that this technology was one, totally safe, 
and would ensure greater yields at less cost. So they were quite happy and willing to give it a try. But in virtually all cases, this claim was utterly false. Thousands of innocent farmers were taken in by the lie. And so we see here a cartoon <laughs> depicting what has been happening here in North America and worldwide, and that is the big rollout of genetic farming has been basically extinguishing natural approaches to agriculture on an unprecedented scale. We see massive increases in lands being planted with genetically modified crops. If we go back not that long ago, mid-1990s, 1996, at that time in Earth's history, 6,563,000 ,000 square miles were planted in GM crops. Ten years later, that figure had risen to 393,828 square miles. Three years later, the figure had increased by nearly 300,000 to 571,400 square miles. And amazingly, in the last few years, since 2009, it jumped astronomically to 3,360,000 square miles. That's a land area larger than the entire continental United States, planted in genetically modified crops. So we see this literally exponentially rising. And it's a very frightening specter that we're looking at. So here we consider what particular foods and the percent modified in the United States of those foods and the percent modified in the world with genetic modification. Soybeans, and most of these are designed to handle the um, herbicides, weed killers, produced by companies like Monsanto. So we have soybeans. We have a stunning 93% of soybeans in the United States are genetically modified. So it's very important when buying your soybean products, always make sure it says organic. Never ever buy anything that says soybean unless it says organic as well. Um, we see here in the world at large, 77% of soybeans around the world are genetically modified. <clears throat> we next look at corn, field corn. In the United States, 86% of corn is genetically modified. And here we see 26% worldwide. Cotton, why should we be worried about cotton? Well, we do wear it and sleep on it, but also we sometimes see it in foods in the form of cotton seed oil is a very pesticide-laden oil, by the way. Avoid it like the plague. But 93% of cotton and cotton seed oil is genetically modified in the U.S., 49% worldwide. And surprisingly, Hawaiian papaya, 80% of papaya coming out of Hawaii has been genetically modified. So prefer the Mexican or Central American variety. Here we see the product called um, canola. Now, most people aren't aware that, you must be aware that there isn't any plant named canola. It's a product name, so what on earth is it derived from? It's, it's rape seed oil that has been genetically modified. 93% um, um, is been modified in the United States, 21% in the world. And that's further modification beyond the basic modification in which they take a toxin out of the rapeseed. This is, this is increased or further GM modification, the 93%. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but you'll want to avoid canola oil for other reasons as well. There's some serious health implications to using that oil. But uh, I hopefully will touch on it in one of my presentations later in the week. Sugarcane. Well, 
they don't have percentages, but there have been 70 trials of um, genetically modified sugarcane in the United States and trials now taking place in Egypt, Australia, Argentina, Brazil, India, Cuba, and South Africa. Sugar beets. In the year 2010, 95% of sugar beets grown in the United States were genetically modified. That means all this table sugar, all the sugar you see in all the canned goods in the supermarkets are going to 95% likely could be from genetically modified sugar beets. 9% um, worldwide, so it's very high in, this, in the U.S. and very low worldwide. Lastly, we look at squash, and they're mentioning zucchini specifically. 13% of zucchini in the U.S. is genetically modified. Now, what's interesting, if we go on, is that there are certain dietary patterns that expose you to genetically modified foods more than any other. And these patterns basically mean, if we look at this, that people who are eating cattle products, pig or ham or bacon, poultry products, chickens, turkeys, um, as well as products that are packaged and processed, they're getting a much greater intake of these foods. For instance, 60 to 70 percent of the packaged and processed foods in our grocery stores in North America have, have GM ingredients in them. So don't trust processed packaged foods. Furthermore, if you're a milk drinker, cow's milk drinker, if you eat beef or enjoy an occasional bacon or order of chicken and Caesar salad, or indulge in processed foods, then GM is going to be much, much higher in your diet. Um, so now let's go beyond these basic issues and look at some of the science. The International Journal of Sociology of Agriculture and Food, Volume 16, Number 1, pages 31 to 49, says, a major conflict is imminent or upon us in science. On the one side are the scientists, the universities, the corporations, who've invested nearly 25 years and tens of billions of dollars in the genetic engineering of organisms. They call it transgenics. On the other side is a flood of evidence that food plant transgenics is fatally flawed and has been resting on a theoretical foundation that has crumbled away as the science of genetics reinvents itself. It goes on to say in that same article, a grape, a fresh tomato, or a grain of wheat can and should be seen as a symphony of compounds that make up a potential gustatory and nutritive experience. In the case of transgenic foods, there may be, quote, rogue, novel, or misformed proteins inadvertently produced in the transgenic process, and which may be allergenic or toxic, meaning poisonous. Under the current system of oversight, meaning government oversight, transgenic foods during the crop development and subsequent stages are inadequately checked for these compounds and are dispensed in a system that is largely untraceable if there are health problem, problems amongst consumers. So I think that's pretty clear and it's quite an indictment. Now what is really a GMO? A GMO is a genetically modified organism. And it is the result of a laboratory process of taking genes from one species and inserting them into another in an attempt to obtain a desired trait or characteristics. Thus, they're known as transgenic organisms. The process can be called GE, genetic engineering, or GM, genetic modification. For purpose of the lecture, we'll stick with one so there's no confusion. We'll stick with GM versus GE. Uh, Monsanto's vision. Let's go back to the 1990s. This is the largest company in the world engaging in this field. There are others. Monsanto executives asked themselves what their ideal future would look like in 15 to 20 years. And they described in this brainstorming session a world with 100% of all commercially 
develops seeds being genetically modified and patented. The steps and the procedures were put in motion for creating a world in which natural seeds would become virtually extinct. Now we see here an interesting picture. Um, terminator seeds. How many of you heard of terminator seeds? See some hands go up. You're aware of what these seeds are and what they do. These are seeds designed to um, basically end their usefulness after only one usage. So if you plant whatever, corn or beans or whatever it is the seed is, when you get a crop, all the seeds are sterile. They're useless. You have to go back and buy more seeds from the original source year after year after year. They're thus called death or terminator seeds. Um, the technical term is genetic use restriction technology. They use the term GERTS, G-U-R-T-S. Way back about eight or nine years ago when I was working as a senior advisor uh, with the Canadian International Development Agency, um, I was invited to a conference at the Convention on Biodiversity Secretariat in Montreal. It's part of the U United Nations uh, Environment Program. And they had a convening of world experts on the issue of GRTS or terminator seeds. And they wanted to have dialogue and discussions as to what were the next steps in relation to public policy on this issue. Well, at that time, and still to this day, the government of Canada and the government of the United States, which happens to be a co-patent holder on these seeds, the Department of Agriculture with Monsanto, um, were there, as were Monsanto representatives. But also there were representatives of different countries, of indigenous peoples organizations, and so forth. And as things turned out, I ended up being nominated to co-chair the meeting. So it was a fascinating experience because you had on the one hand, Monsanto and its representatives and governments of Canada and the US basically pushing their way forward to get the blessing of everyone at the meeting on these seeds. But there was very strong resistance. And as things turned out in the end, the majority at that meeting voted against governments supporting the production and use of these seeds. Well, it then went to the signatories to the um, Convention on Biodiversity, over 170 countries, and the US bullied its way and they wanted all the recommendations rescinded that occurred at that conference in Montreal. So it's quite an interesting experience to go through. Now we look at the issue of silencing science and scientists. A very prominent scientist named Arpad Puztai went public about his accidental discovery that GM potatoes severely damaged the immune system of higher life forms such as mammals and the vital organs in rats. And by the way, rats have over 90% similar physiology to human beings. That's why they're used in laboratory testing. Well, when this happened, he was suspended from his employment at the prestigious Scottish Research Institute, uh, where he'd worked for 35 years. He was silenced with threats of a lawsuit while the Institute denied and or distorted his findings. So, you know, when, when the truth comes out, there are very powerful forces that seek to silence it. The story of Pestaz, uh, Pestai made headlines throughout Europe for months, alerting the public to some of the serious health risks of consuming GM foods. And this in part contributed to the fact that the European Union still has in place a ban on GM foods. But there's a lot of pressure occurring in Brussels to reverse this decision right now. So that may yet happen. But powerful interests ensured that this story of genetically modified potatoes damaging the internal organs of these animals was literally blacked out of the newspapers in the United States and Canada. We never really heard about it. And as most of you know today, these two countries refuse to label genetically modified foods. Now that may change soon because the only state I'm aware of in the United States in which the public can literally make public law 
and overturn the decision of their legislatures is in California. They have a referendum system. And um, as I understand, in recent weeks, they're launching a referendum which will legally require all GM foods or foods containing GM products to be properly labeled in the state of California. If that referendum passes, you can be sure that that will spread very rapidly across the, U the US and hopefully Canada. So that's one positive development. So, you know, in, in um, the Old Testament scriptures, in the book of Job, there's a reference to the animals teaching you certain lessons. Well, it's sort of interesting because we're going to look at animals in relation to what they think and how they respond instinctively to GM foods. Farmers repeatedly let their pigs or cows into pens with troughs of GM corn and non-GM corn. The animals always choose the natural corn and will quickly walk away from the GM corn. An Iowa farmer nailed an ear of GM corn and non-GM onto the trees near his house. The squirrels always ate only the natural stuff. When the only offering was GM corn, they would rather go hungry than touch it. Mice broke into a natural corn bag and finished it, ignoring the GM cobs in another bag. And uh, the last point here is experiments show that chickens, elk, deer, and raccoons will all avoid GM corn. It seems like it's only the people who don't have the intelligence. <laughs> now, we've all heard of, I'm sure you've heard of Roundup, the um, herbicide. Its more technical name is gly, uh, glyphosate, al glyphosate <coughs> um, alias Roundup. Well, glyphosate impairs a plant's defenses against both pathogens and diseases. So in other words, it might kill weeds, but it makes plants more susceptible to disease and to pathogenic bacteria. Furthermore, it poisons the beneficial soil bacteria, um, which you know, fixes the nitrogen and it increases the incidence of pathogens in the soil. Thirdly, it causes root fungi problems that seem to encourage sudden death syndrome in plants. It also reduces the availability of key um, food crop micronutrients for plants as well as in turn animals and humans. These include manganese, copper, potassium, iron, um, magnesium, calcium, and zinc. And lastly, and most seriously, cause birth defects in both animals and humans when exposed to glyphosate during pregnancy. And these are, that's, this is an actual photograph of a legless, armless baby in Latin America whose mother was exposed to this herbicide. And there have been hundreds of cases, maybe thousands. It's very, very tragic. What it also does is it brings about what are called superweeds. And there are numerous accounts of superweeds, and there are many, many articles about, about this danger. They develop from the overuse of this herbicide. Fifteen years after uh, Roundup Ready corn and soy was first on the scene, there came into being at least ten different species of highly resistant weeds called superweeds found in at least 22 of the United States as well as similar superweeds sprouting up in Australia, China, and Brazil. Superweeds undermine the benefits that GM crops are supposed to offer by a number of, for, for a number of reasons. They boost the costs of agriculture, they cut crop yields, they reduce soil tillage, they intensify toxic pesticide applications, and increase contamination of the soils, the waterways, and the water tables. The picture shows a superweed grasping the farmer's tractor there. I don't think they're quite that bad, but who knows? <laughs> and so the question is asked, you know, is the corn that we're eating patented or unpatented? 
Well, you know, I've been told that most of the popular corns like peaches and cream, which I haven't seen in BC, but it's very common in the East, um, is non-genetically modified. Um, and most, most of the corn that is modified is fed to cattle or you know, other animals. But it is still possible that we w- might be picking up GM corn at a farmer's market. We can't always be sure because of the labeling issue. So I always feel a little bit nervous when I eat corn, <laughs> but I love corn, so it makes it difficult. Um, we see here um, there's both a book and a movie worth getting entitled The World According to Monsanto. I'd recommend that you obtain both the DVD as well as the book. It's very powerful and makes um, unpleasant bedtime reading. Fraud in GM science. Well, you know, fraud is everywhere in the so-called scientific world, in the medical field, in the biomedical arena, and as well in the field of, quote, agricultural science. For instance, the company Aventis heated their Starlink corn four times longer than standard before testing for intact protein. Um, So it was to their advantage to do that because the findings would more likely be in their favor. Monsanto fed mature animals diets with only one-tenth of their protein derived from GM soy. So the other 90% was from natural. And then they said, these results are the results of eating GM whatever. So um, there was a little bit of truth in there, but it was only 10% truth and 90% lie. Uh, Researchers injected cows with 147th the normal amount of RBGH before testing hormone levels in the milk and uh, pasteurized the milk 120 times longer than normal to see if the hormone was destroyed. You know, they go to these extremes. I remember the sugar industry uh, years ago where they were trying to prove that sugar does not cause hyperactivity in children. So what they did was they fed these kids huge amounts of desserts and sugars and then gave them four or five teaspoons of sugar and said, oh, there's really been no change. When the reality was they were sugared up to their ears to begin with. There's all kinds of fraud that goes on. Uh, Monsanto used stronger acid and more than 1,250 times the international standard amount of of a digestive enzyme to prove how quickly that their protein degraded uh, with this enzyme. So a lot of chicanery and fraud. Now, these are some of the interesting GMO field trials that have taken place. And by the way, those diagrams of a carrot scorpion and a um, caterpillar green bean are just artists' imaginations. (laughs) Um, Corn engineered with human genes by Dow. Sugarcane engineered with human genes, the Hawaii Agriculture Research Center. Corn engineered with jellyfish genes, Stanford University. Tobacco engineered with lettuce genes, University of Hawaii. Rice engineered with human genes. Um, And this was a company called Applied Phytologics. And corn engineered with hepatitis virus genes. And this is a company called Protogene. These are the kinds of experiments. Those are just a sampling. This is sort of an interesting um, fast food of the future. (laughs) It is imaginative, not uh, really on the market. But it talks here about triple MSG, FDA approved, box raised tortured chicken with tasty GM corn, promotes excessive brain tumors and premature death, and microwavable for added carcinogens. Um, anyway, it's sort of a, an interesting portrayal of this mix. And then you've got the uh, tomato with a fish's tail and potatoes with eyes, real eyes, <laughs> and so on. Um, a bit of humor, and of course, Frankenstein looking on. Um, but we are encountering real killing fields 
that are very quiet, silent killers that are diddly and do not discriminate. They target babies, the elderly, teenagers, young adults, middle-aged housewives and businessmen alike. They poison livestock, pets, and wildlife, and the people behind them deny any complicity in this carnage. Who, <coughs> excuse me, who or what are these silent, diddly killers? They're the beautiful, uniform, and seemingly beneficial killing fields of GMO crops. And the people behind them are the U.S. government, the Rockefellers, Monsanto, Dow, DuPont, and Syngenta. That's a quotation from Barbara Peterson in uh, one of her very insightful articles. So what kind of dangers really are there with GM plants and animals? Now what we're going to present gets a little scary. We talked about the killing fields. Well, do you think people might be really dying from these foods? Well, let's, let's look at what's really going on. Genetic engineering creates unpredicted, as well as I could say unpredictable, alterations. No matter what gene is transferred, the gene insertion process is accomplished by either shooting genes from a gene gun into a plate of cells or using bacteria to infect the cell with foreign DNA. But both create mutations in and around the insertion site and elsewhere. And we'll see a little later on, it's not just a few mutations. It can be hundreds and sometimes thousands of mutations. Other methods include injecting foreign DNA into fertilized eggs with a very fine needle and using electric shocks to create holes in the membrane covering the sperm and then forcing the new DNA into the sperm through these holes. <clears throat> Here we talk, as I said, hundreds to thousands of mutations. The um, transformed cell is cloned into a plant through a process called tissue culture, which results in additional hundreds or thousands of mutations throughout the genome of the plant. And these can pose very unique dangers um, among large numbers of native genes, which can be mutated, they can be deleted, they can be permanently turned on or off the native genes. The Royal Society of Canada acknowledged that the default prediction for GM crops would include, and I quote, a range of collateral changes in expression of other genes, changes in the pattern of proteins produced, and their changes in metabolic activities. So really what, what they're doing is playing God with these plants creating entirely new aberrations that were never intended to exist. It's actually very frightening. So what happens when rats are actually fed GM potatoes? We see what happens is proliferative cell growth in both the stomach and the intestines. Here we see non-GM in the stomach lining, and this is what happens when the GM is fed, the GM foods. And we see a radical um, change taking place. Here is non-GM in the intestinal wall and GM. And again, very, very different processes taking place. The name of this article was Effects of Diets Containing Genetically Modified Potatoes, Expressing uh, Galanthus Novalis Lectin on Rat Small Intestines, Lancet Medical Journal. Okay, let's look at the next slide. This particular scientist is from Russia. Irina Ermakova, biologist at the Institute of Higher Nervous Activity and Neurophysiology, part of the Russian Academy of Sciences. She states the morphology and biochemical structure of rats are very similar to those of humans, and this makes the results we obtained very disturbing. And we're going to look at some of her results. In fact, when she found these things, she presented them in Europe, and that led to the ban on GM foods, I think, in Europe to a great degree. And she was told by the Russian Academy she could no longer do any work in this field. She was banned from doing further research. Um, I'm sure pressures were put on to make that happen. So here we see, by this scientist, GM-fed soy on this side. And this is the liver structure. And there are adverse structural changes taking place in the liver. This is soy, GM soy, and this is natural soy. You see those little cells, how tiny they are? They're massively 
increased in size. And, um, and then there are large spaces. So what you have are major structural changes to the liver. It's, they're, they're reinventing the liver, if you will. And the liver is our body's most important detoxifying organ. If the liver goes, we're gone. We have to you know, have a liver. Let's continue. These are the testicles of rats. Now, the same scientist, she presented this um, at a conference, the European Parliament in Brussels. And what you see here is a natural testicle of a rat, a healthy rat, being fed normal natural foods. After they're fed GM soy, the testicle shrinks and deeply darkens. The cell structure has been modified. This is the control, natural. As you can see, that's natural cells, and these are the unnatural cells. There's evidence that actually what's occurring, it will create infertility in the animal um, and, and other adverse changes as well in the reproductive process. Here is something quite alarming. This is the average size and weight of GM-fed offspring showing severe stunting of growth. These two animals are basically from the same family group, the same age, and here we see a, the rat fed naturally. And this one was fed the GM foods. And it's pretty visible, pretty frightening what the results are. Very, very clear. The same scientist, Irina Ermakova. And um, those were stunning results there. High death rates in pups. Um, there were three experiments conducted, again, at the Russian National Academy of Sciences by this same scientist. And um, she presented this at an um, international disaster reduction conference in Switzerland in August of 2006. Three experiments at the academy revealed that 51.6% of offspring from GM fed, uh, the GM fed group died within the first three weeks after being fed. The naturally fed, the death rate was 10%. Um, so you see a, a basically a, a massively higher death rate level among the GM fed animals. Here we see photographs of what they look like. The naturally fed animals, the survivors, the GM fed animals that perished. And quite a physical contrast in the two groups. They even um, quit growing hair. <laughs> anyway, so you know they don't know what they're doing with these these um, aberrations, these Frankenstein foods, if you will. What the results are very frightening. A French study: three Monsanto GM corns were examined for their physiological effects. The company's own data, and we read here, quote, clearly underlines adverse impacts on kidneys and the liver, the dietary detoxifying organs, as well as different levels of damage to the heart, the adrenal glands, spleen, and the hematopoietic system. Likely dangerous to mammalian health, including livestock and humans, the study concluded. So um, it affects the spleen, the adrenal glands, the heart, and the liver all the vital organs that, uh, that we need to protect. This was quite an interesting study. It was done in Italy. The mice were fed GM BT corn and expressed a wide variety of immune responses that were symptomatic of all these health conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, various cancers, allergies, and Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. And problems linked to infant health. GM foods raises the huge specter of potential problems of infant morbidity and mortality. Italian researchers fed male mice GM soy and observed damage to their testicles and their young sperm cells. And the embryos of the offspring of parents fed GM soy revealed altered DNA functioning. So it even affects the DNA. 
flavor, savor, tomato. And this scientist who worked on this tomato made the comment, I got to tell you, you can be Chef Boyardee and the mice still do not want to like these tomatoes. They were eventually force fed the tomato through their gastric tubes, through gastric tubes and stomach washes. Several developed stomach lesions. Seven of the 40 died within two weeks. And the tomato was then approved by the FDA without any further tests for the American public. Um, health risks. Jeffrey Smith is probably the leading advocate in North America, in the world, on this issue. Um, they have an Institute for Responsible Technology where they do a lot of research. I got some of my information from them. He's written a book uh, on this issue, which is well worth getting, Seeds of Deception. And he documents at least 65 serious health risks from GM products of all kind, kinds. <clears throat> to name a few, several US farmers reported sterility or fertility problems among their pigs and cows fed GM corn. Investigators in India have documented fertility problems, abortions, premature births, other serious health issues, including deaths among buffaloes fed GM cottonseed products. Amalgamation. Now we're going to look a little bit apart from the food issue. Um, we're talking about amalgamation of plants with animals, with humans, very strange scientific experiments. Excuse me. In 2003, scientists successfully fused human cells with rabbit eggs. The embryos were the first human animal chimeras successfully created. They survived. 2004, the Mayo Clinic research created pigs with human blood flowing through their bodies. 2005, Stanford University conducted experiments to create mice with human brains. And this year, in recent headlines, there have been 150 human animal, animal hybrids secretively grown in labs in Britain, in the UK. This includes animal eggs fertilized by a human sperm, which they refer to as cybrids, in which a human nucleus is implanted into an animal cell, and chimeras in which human cells are being mixed with animal embryos. So, you know, there's an author I know who talked about the old world being destroyed because of amalgamation. Well, you know, if, if you really understand ancient history, um, there was, in fact, very advanced science if we go far enough back in time. And that science was ultimately destroyed universally. And it's, it's come back to life in the 21st century. We see here now a little bit of humor, if we can bring some humor into this. Um, this woman mentions that um, her husband's ethical objections to frog genes and potato breeding were conveniently forgotten when his potatoes start jumping into his bag. Um, sort of a cute cartoon. And artists have had some fun with this, such as creating um, a combination of um, kangaroo and uh, some kind of uh, antelope or whatever it is, um, and uh, centipede dog. Anyway, <laughs> Photoshop creations, which are, of course, much more innocent than what we're, we're dealing with. So what is the global picture? 30 countries around the world, including Australia, Japan, the European Union countries, all have significant restrictions or outright bans on the production of GMOs because they're not proven safe. But in the USA, the FDA approved commercial production of GMOs based on studies conducted by the companies and profit from their sale allows them in, in the US as well as Canada. It's very sad. Interestingly, in Hungary, very recently, July of 2011, it was announced that every crop field in their country known to contain GM corn was to be plowed under and destroyed, which they did. And um, 
the government has announced that it's now planning to make the distribution of GMO seeds a felony. So some countries are taking this seriously, fortunately. I think in time, maybe, the US and Canada will take it seriously, hopefully. But things don't look too good at the moment. In the United States, the Obama administration has been in a frenzy to green light GM crops. Early in 2011, at it, uh, I think it was January, there was full deregulation of Monsanto's Roundup Ready Alpha, Alfalfa, a GM variety designed to withstand their Roundup herbicide. Days later, the U.S. Department of Agriculture announced they would deregulate Roundup Ready sugar beets, followed by the deregulation of Syngenta's en Enogen corn. So a whole number of major GM products are still being approved. The regulations are all being eradicated by government. Meanwhile, the FDA is considering the commercial release of genetically modified salmon, which by the way are gigantic, uh, grow several times faster than conventional salmon, and are of gigantic size. But there is a non-GMO project. It's not far from here, just over the border. And I'll give you their address at the end here of the presentation. And they're inviting food producers to um, register their products if they have no GMOs. And they have five and a half thousand products registered right now. So it's a place for consumers to go to help find foods that are guaranteed to be non-genetically modified. This project, it's nonprofit. Um, they're working with both the US and Canada to offer consumers in both countries a non-GMO choice. Organic projects, they're based in Bellingham. That's their telephone number, and they also have a website, the uh, nongmoproject.org. So I'd encourage you to, uh, to go there and check it out. So I think that is my last slide, and thank you for your time.